This is Coons Ford Turf Talk with Bruce Posner. 60 minutes of Maryland athletics and your phone calls at 410-481-1300. Now, here's Bruce Posner and Turp Talk. Good evening, Turp fans. Bruce is away from the microphone. This is Wayne Viner, and you are listening to Turp Talk. Got a lot to cover tonight. Tony Massenberg will be in to talk about his new book on Len Bias. Mason will be on to talk about early signing period for your Maryland Terrapins football team and who the winners and losers are across the country. We'll have Dennis talking NFL. And later in the show, Luke Jackson from Pressbox will be on with his Terps of the Year. But for right now, let's bring him on. It's Tony Massenberg, played for the Terps. You guys all watched him. Then he spent a long time in the NBA. Now he's writing books. Tony, welcome in. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hey, well, thank you for coming on. You've all seen Tony on our post-game shows on Terp Talk. So... You and Walt Williams decide to write a book called Lessons from Lenny. What made it seem like a good idea for you guys to turn into authors? Well, uh, the first thing was that um, we're celebrating the 100 years of Maryland basketball. And we're also, Walt and I, uh, celebrating 30 years of just brotherhood at Maryland and friendship. And you can't really talk about the last 100 years of Maryland basketball without talking about the last 30 in particular. And so uh, we include Len Bias in that and his legacy and the positive influence that it had on us. And we understand the tragedy uh, that it was at the time. But from his death, the University of Maryland and, and a lot of college basketball and society in general was reshaped when you talk about the things that spawn off of that tragedy, changes to, to drug laws in Congress and certainly changes at the University of Maryland that ultimately uh, led to them winning a national championship in 2001. And Walt and I were a part of that because we made a concerted effort to come back and, and be a part of rebuilding the program. And clearly, Walt didn't play with Len Bias. He came in two years after his death. But I did play with him, and I was there uh, essentially for the entire thing. And Walt sort of ties in the... The, the new era, because when he came in, um, he spawned a legion of guys to follow, and that legion of guys would eventually uh, culminate into a championship in 2001. And that was a long process from the time that Lenny died from 1986 until 2001. And we just talk about the things that transpired there and, and how relevant they are to, to, to the present, as well as it being a blueprint uh, that the kids that are there now on the football team can sort of look at and reflect on and, and, and learn from in the way that we dealt with it at the time um, of Lenny's death. So uh, there's some relevance there just on Jordan McNair's death, but also we understand how important it is for kids to understand that you can rebuild from a tragedy like this. That's very well put. I was on campus that summer. I uh, lived across from Washington Hall. Can't remember the name of the dorm on the other side, but I lived there over the summer. And that was one of his death was just you know, one of the most tragic events. We were all huge basketball fans, and then we were had to put up with an influx of media that we'd never seen before on campus. And it, it was a just a crazy time. But uh, as far as you go. How well did you know Len Bias? Well, um, again, Lenny was my teammate, and, and I probably should have started the conversation off by saying, first of all, Walt and I were huge Len Bias fans. Len Bias wasn't just a teammate to me. Len Bias was my idol. He was the reason why I chose the University of Maryland out of high school. As a kid who grew up in Southern Virginia, uh, amongst UVA fans and Virginia Tech fans, and, and several University of Maryland North uh, University of North Carolina fans because the part of Virginia that I grew up in is, is right on the North Carolina border. So we had a little spillover from UNC also. But I was enamored with uh, Len Bias when he had that breakout season his freshman year in the ACC tournament. I'm sorry, his sophomore year in the ACC tournament. And from that point on, he was my favorite player. I just I, I loved the way he played the game. I loved his skill set. Um, he was flashy. He was dominant. He was. He had the type of personality uh, 
that you knew was a winner and a guy that just made you wanted to that you wanted to go to battle with him. So uh, once I became a senior and drew some attention from the University of Maryland and from Leffel Cassell, there was no doubt in my mind that I was coming to the University of Maryland. And Walt Williams was inspired a lot the same way. So as two guys who eventually went on to play professionally, where Lynn Bias would have played had he lived, we felt um, just inspired by him and his presence, and we felt that there's never been a positive story told about his influence on so many people that, that truly loved him um, as a brother and, and, and teammate. Uh, we just wanted to put that out there because clearly everybody knows how he died, but a lot of people don't know how he lived and the, the, the positive influence that he had along the way. And it's not just me and, and, and Walt Williams, you know, Juan Dixon and, and Chris Wilcox and Steve Blake and, and Steve Francis and all these guys to a man, when you talk to them, they'll tell you how much they love Len Bias. And that is Tony Massenberg talking about the new book, Lessons from Lenny. I'm looking on the Internet right now. You can find the book everywhere. I'm looking at the Barnes & Noble site. So if you're looking for an extra Christmas gift for, for yourself as a Terp fan, take a look at this book. We are also offering uh, personally autographed books through our website, website at LessonsFromLenny.com. The personal autograph books can only be purchased through our website, LessonsFromLenny.com. And we're going to continue to offer those uh, for as long as we can. But they're also, as you said, available through Barnes & Noble and Amazon as well. So uh, we really hope that people understand that this is just not a sports story. It's a life story because there are so many other things that happen from a, from a society perspective that change uh, because of his death and the fact that this happened in the nation's capital, right in the backyard of Congress. And, and so uh, laws were implemented. Um, there was a sweeping change in this country because of the way that men by his side. And, and we also want to make people understand that it's, it's just not a sports story. It's a, it's a life story and, well, and one a, that I think everybody could relate to. It's a story about society. I mean, it brought yeah, up the exactly. say no to, to drugs it, yep. it made his parents a national story. I mean, he yep. went from being a, what is the second pick in the draft? Yes. To pick being, in the so that's headline news, but he then went on, and everybody who's our age, a little younger and a little older, everybody knows the name Len Bias. It's not necessarily from basketball. And right. so, yes, a lot of good came from this, and the university did win a na- ultimately win a national championship, but the the tragedy, I mean, you're talking about him being your favorite player. There were thousands and thousands of people in this area that he was the ultimate superstar. So on a basketball side, and it's a lot of conjecture, was he as good as anybody you've ever seen? Was he as good as Michael Jordan? Uh, in my opinion, at the uh, time, again, because we're biased by cut short, we'll clearly never know what he could have become at the pro level. But at the college level, uh, absolutely. Um, he was as dominant, if not more dominant. And a lot of people compare him to Michael Jordan um, at the college level as a bigger, stronger version of Michael Jordan. And so uh, you have to think, um, had he lived and had the advantage of playing with Hall of Famers like Larry Bird and Kevin McHale and Dennis Johnson, you know, these guys would have groomed Lenny the right way as a professional and they would have helped him reach his full potential. And as great as he was, he didn't he had not come close to his full potential. So uh much like we saw Michael Jordan explode at the pro level, um I think we would have seen uh, a similar situation with Lynn Bias and, and who knows uh how history would have turned out in, in that conversation for greatest player of all time. So when you ask me um, how good he was. Uh, I played for 15 years professionally, and I can honestly tell you, we've seen a lot of guys that we thought would be the next Michael Jordan or the next Magic Johnson. I have never seen a guy that I said reminds me of Len Bias because I've yet to see his skill set. And guys like Jay Billis and, 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 and Mike Krzyzewski and some of these guys will tell you the same thing. Johnny Dawkins was even quoted as saying he's still looking for a guy 
that reminds him of Len Bias because we just have never seen the combination of athleticism and skill and the, and the, 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 the killer mentality, meaning I will win at all costs. The same mentality that Michael Jordan has. We have yet to see that in a package like the one Len Bias had. Well, sure, Red Arbach went on because he, he was thrilled that he got Len Bias. He got the guy the Celtics wanted to rebuild their dynasty around. Well, and Red Arbach said that he's seen for years, and he's right. You know, I have a little bit of privileged information on the inside, and he really did. He watched Len Bias from the time he was sophomore, and he, he literally maneuvered um, from a administrative standpoint in the organization to be able to move up and draft Len Bias. And so uh, for a basketball legend like Red Arbach to covet Len Bias the way that he did, I think it, that says an awful lot about who he thought he could be as a professional. And, and, and clearly they were putting their organization reputation and, and, and future behind him and so um, i think that says a lot all right that is tony massenberg we're talking about the book lessons from lenny and it takes you from it starts on chapter one with the dream and then quickly turns to the nightmare and then the story from there and i'd love to have you come back we'll talk a little bit more in depth maybe we'll do it after a maryland basketball game and you can make it out there for those of you who don't know you can watch tony massenberg talk about the wizards on CSN. Tony, thanks so much for being on. Guys, go out and buy the book. Once again, you can find that. Uh, Tony, what's the website to look for? Uh, the website is LessonsFromLenny.com. That is our personal website where you can get books as well as personal autograph books. And the book is also available through Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. And you can also follow me at Tony Massenberg and Walt Williams at Walt the Wizard Williams. All right, man. Thanks for being on, and go Terps. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me, guys. All righty. And I know Mason's around here someplace, uh, but he'll be in in a moment. That That's interesting because I went to school there. To me, it's fascinating. I lived it. I know Tony. He's done the postgame show. We've talked to Walt on the postgame shows. And to have him have them write a book, that talks about history that a lot of us have been through to me it, it's amazing so i'm going to go grab this book from them maybe on saturday uh when seton hall comes in to xfinity center and the basketball season goes on one of the coolest things is the cover of the book with len whose head is even with the rim and those long arms soaring way above to catch a pass, I believe, probably from Keith Gatlin looking to dunk that down in Cole Fieldhouse. But, of course, those were the great days of Maryland basketball and rocking Cole Fieldhouse. And as Kyle searches in vain for Mason, <laughs> I'll be in to talk about the recruiting. And I think Mike Loxley had a good day for Maryland today. He got enough commits from the guys that he really wanted to come in. And as we're going to discuss, uh, it's almost as important, Mason, to talk about some of the guys that didn't commit someplace else. That once Mike gets finished coaching at Alabama, he will try and seal the deal for the February 6th National Signing Day. What do you make of this, Mason? Uh, it's, it's a mixed bag tonight. Um, you know, it's definitely got some good guys on board, obviously. Isaiah Hazel, the four-star that locks it already flipped, and it's going to be um, good to watch in these coming months because we got guys like Nick Cross from Damasco that didn't sign, and Kellen Robinson from St. John's that didn't sign. So there, there are some wins in there, but definitely some guys that I would have loved to see sign the paper tonight or earlier today that did not. Well, they don't know if they're really wanted. Some of these kids are waiting to see who the position coaches are. And that just unsettled at the moment. And then it will be until the bowl games are done. And uh, Maryland got some some need guys. I mean, they want a speed edge rusher. They, they want probably some more defensive backs. But they're loaded at tailback. They're now sort of loaded at tight end. They think they have the middle of the defensive line. All the parts are there. So you're starting to talk about what do you need that you don't have and I think one place is going to be punter because Wade Lees went pro. 
and you always can use more cornerbacks at Maryland for some reason. But where do you think Maryland really needs to look for recruiting, or is it just general trying to build an 18-person class? Uh, well, I think you hit on one of them, and punter is definitely going to be one of them through the next um, coming days. And I'm trying to pull up here. Maryland did offer a punter a uh, few days ago. The other place that I think Maryland's really at this point lacking is corner. And, of course, they brought in um, some talent there with possibly, you're talking about Dino Tomlin, but he's starting to look like more of a wide receiver. A guy that I really wanted to see them sign that I believe is well, one of the most underrated guys in all of the country is Tavon Tank Land from Virginia Beach. He plays at Ocean Lakes High School. That's the guy that I really wanted to see them lock up today because the more and more coaches get a hand on his film, the more and more coaches are going to try and come after him to flip him. But corner, punter, and maybe that speed edge rusher, I, I don't know. That's kind of starting to look a little bit dicey. But there are definitely some places that Maryland needed to get guys that they did. But, of course, there are definitely places that there are still needs. There are. I've, right now, one of the other interesting points is that Marcus Lewis, who was one of the transfers, the young man who left the team, in late October, seems to be back on board at cornerback. So we'll see how that works out if he sticks around for Mike Loxley. Do you think that him staying at Alabama and coaching through the national championships a good thing for Maryland, or do you think it had an effect on what happened today? Well, there's no doubt that it had an effect. Uh, you're talking about a guy that was, you know, it really started to feel like he was getting some things from, you know, some inside sources. That he was really getting things rolling towards the end of his short stay these past weeks in College Park. And then, you know, he's back down in Alabama, and everybody knows how Alabama works. If you're there, you're on that staff. You're not, you're not recruiting for Maryland. You're not, you might make a few calls for Maryland, but that's it. You know, it's about Alabama there. It's about a national championship. And I don't really think if you're just looking at Maryland, it's a good thing. It's not, it's not a good thing that he went there. But I feel just in general that, he had to do that. I mean, he's run this offense. He's a Royals award-winning coordinator. There was no way that he wasn't going back to Alabama unless they didn't want him back, which was obvious that they wanted Mike Oxley back on their staff. If they play two games, so they play on the 29th and then another week after that or so, there's going to be a lot of free publicity that Mike Oxley's going to get being on television. And I, I'm not, and I've read this other places, it isn't just coming from me, that it's a great way to pump the Maryland brand, because every time they talk about the Alabama offense, they're going to say, and Mike Loxley's the offensive coordinator who's going to Maryland. So there's a lot of free eyeballs there. The other part is, I'm not so sure how reasonable it was to think that if these young men who have looked at all of these universities and committed to, let's say, there was a defensive back who committed to Michigan, and Maryland talked about he might be a flippable guy, he might come to Maryland now. That, that's a heck of a, a sea change to go, you know, I looked at all of these schools, I picked Michigan, I'm set there, now Mike Loxley shows up. So maybe we were a little bit uh, overly optimistic that somebody that Loxley was going to walk in the building and change everybody's mind. This really is about the next recruiting class, the 2020 class. Do you have an idea how good the local 2020 class is supposed to be? Well, yeah, there, there's argument over that it could be the best that's ever come to this area. But really quickly, back to the flipping, I mean, we're Maryland fans. What do, you, what do you expect? I mean, we saw Dwayne Haskins go near signing day. We saw Keandre Jones go. We, we've seen everything bad happen here when it comes to recruiting, and especially football. So people expect guys to flip. I mean, you've got to look at it from the Maryland perspective, well, not the national one. We got Maryland Hazel. has been I injured still, flipping okay. so many times. But we got Hazel. who showed up with a four-star. I still think we're going to get Nick Cross, the young man who yep. Lunsford, who signed from good counsel, was going to go someplace else. He switched to Maryland. So, yeah, we got some flips, but we weren't going to go get 20 of them. But that's not... Um, I'm just saying that Michael Oxley is just such a master recruiter that people thought that he can do it, and honestly, that's still all on the table. Not, there are a bunch of guys that held off on signing today, whether they could have or they couldn't have, or you know, depending on how they feel, maybe they just wanted to sign in February. Today, today was that kind of uncertain about this move. If, I, if there was even a little bit of uncertainty, 
in my mind, I don't think I would be signing today. The guys that signed today, I felt were were ready to make that decision permanently. And you know, it's good that there is one, but at the same time, you know, for Maryland, it's it's not great to have it this time, but of course in the coming years we're going to appreciate this this early signing period. Well, Maryland moved up one spot today from 82 to 81 on the national charts. Uh, of course, topping the charts, then we have to go to break, so we'll have you back in the third segment with Luke, but of course, topping the recruiting charts today, it's Alabama, Georgia, Texas A&M, LSU, I think of Oregon a bit as a surprise at five, Clemson, Michigan had a really good day. Oklahoma, Texas, and of course Penn State. I mean, wouldn't be football without Penn State. Any surprises in there for you? Not really. Um, you know, the Ducks have been down for a few years, but it was coming back. There's too much there. They have great facilities, great place. It's just known as a great place to go play football. It's not necessarily the crazy environment of the Alabama or the Georgia or the A and M, but it has it has its perks and you know they've they did the right thing because if you look at what Oregon did they had you know, Willie Taggart who then moved back across the country over here to the East Coast Florida State where he was wasn't too successful this past year but they went out and they signed their offensive coordinator from the Taggart era to become the head coach to try and keep that positive recruiting energy and not have too much turnover and it worked out for them so it did big props to the Ducks they made the right move for them all right. Well, Bruce is away from the microphone. This is Wayne Viner, and that is Mason on the phone. He'll be back in segment three. But right now, we have to go out to break. Folks, hang on, because we'll have Dennis Kulatsis talking Ravens and NFL here in a moment. You are listening to Coons Ford Turp Talk. We'll be back after these commercial messages. Welcome back to Coons Ford Turp Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner is away from the microphone this evening. This is Wayne Viner, and on the phone right now, we have Dennis Kulatsis over at Coons Ford. Dennis, how you doing tonight? I'm doing well. How about yourself, Wayne? I'm doing okay. Uh, of course, you have to leave room at the end to talk about that Ford Edge ST, and we will get to that, because I'm excited to hear what you think of that. Looks like the new supercar coming out at Ford, even though it's not really a car. I want to start off talking about Ravens and Chargers, and today's news story that I saw is that Harbaugh's not worried about the 86 carries that, that Jackson's had as a quarterback, and it certainly sounds like a win now, we'll figure this out later. Are you concerned with your quarterback having 86 carries so far? Not, not really, Wayne. Six of those carries were due to a victory formation kneel down. So let's, let's take that number down a little bit. But no, the, those carries come on design plays more often than not. That he's, you know, he's going down early. He's going out of bounds. Uh, he's getting better uh, by the game as every game is slowing down for him. But he is who he is. And as you mentioned, the Ravens have to win now. They'll figure out uh, the, uh, the rest of it later. But right now, they have to play to his strengths. Uh, he certainly opened up the middle of the defense with his style as, as he forces the defense to play 11-11 football versus 11-10. Now, look, they only have a few more games to go, so, you know, if it's not broke, why fix it at this point in the season? Oh, it's actually interesting, close to fascinating that this works, but so far it works. And, look, Tampa was in that game until suddenly they weren't. And it seemed to happen quickly. You weren't sure what was going on, and then the Ravens' style of football took the game over. And yeah, it, no doubt about it. And you know, now we're seeing the reports that maybe San Diego's going to use Derwin James as a spy on, on Lamar Jackson. But think about it: if you put a safety, especially center fielding safety like uh, Derwin James, then you then you're susceptible to the the deep ball. They can only play cover one or cover zero at that point. And Lamar Jackson has to beat the, the Chargers at that point with his arm. The receivers have to get separation. But uh, you got to pick your poison when you're, when you're playing the Ravens' offense these days. Well, the Chargers don't want to get into a situation where they can't get to the ball. I mean, that's been the Ravens' mode of operation. It's almost uh, like when you see in college somebody comes in to play Navy, and Navy has the ball the whole game, and that's how they stay in it. And it look, so far it works, but I haven't seen anybody pull this off in the NFL for a long stretch of time, but you're seeing it now. Do you think anybody else has the talent to try this? It's a, it seems to be a great way to take a team that might not – I mean, you saw him before he was in with Flacco at quarterback, and they were going nowhere. 
Seems like a great way to take a team and get them to compete better. Yeah, no question about it, uh, Wayne. We're very excited about it. Uh, look, they're playing the Chargers, what amounts to uh, in the soccer stadium. The, you're going to have about 30,000 fans there. The Chargers will not have a, a home field advantage. It's not going to be uh, the decibel level that it was when their Ravens traveled to Kansas City. So I'm very hopeful that uh, we'll see more of the same. And if, as the game goes uh, deeper, if it's close, uh, I, I, you know, I would like the Ravens' chance to come home with a victory. I don't think it's too big of a game for them. They're only a four-and-a-half-point favorite, which shows the kind of respect they're getting out of Vegas right now. And it's probably worth it. In other NFL news, uh, looks like Cam Newton's hung it up for this year with some bad shoulders and all those hits seem to be taking an effect on him. And for a long time, he looked like Superman, and he just doesn't anymore. Um, did you expect more from Cam as this season went on? Yeah, I think so. They're nice. There's a just a such a specimen, just a, a very big quarterback. And uh, unlike uh, Lamar Jackson, he needs to go down early. <laughs> he, he needs to, you know, he's just a big, powerful guy, and those hits do add up and, uh, on him. And he had Christian McCaffrey in the backfield and DJ Moore. He's got some weapons. Uh, he looked good early on, but there's a team like they look very like a playoff team when they beat the Ravens and uh, in midseason they looked like a Super Bowl team, and they have tailed off since then. So not surprising that uh, he's calling it a season with all those hit, hits he's taken thus yeah. far. Uh, quite a few of these teams now it looks like the season's a little too long. The Patriots yeah. the other night looked like they uh, might be getting old. Is that, a, in all of your vast experience, is this just a little swoon, or is age actually catching up with the Patriots? I think it's catching up, uh, Wayne. I, I, you know, we saw Tom Brady, especially in his last pass in the end zone. He didn't step into the throw. We kind of stepped sideways. Uh, it's been a long season. He's taken a lot of, an awful lot of hits, but they're still the Patriots until further notice. But we've seen them drop back to the pack. We've also seen the Rams. Uh, they lost to the Eagles the other night. Um, so right now, it's almost anybody's game. It's going to be whoever gets hottest here the next couple of weeks and was able to sustain that, that momentum into the playoffs. But a lot of times, teams uh, peak too early in the season. That may have been the case with the Rams and the Patriots. And New Orleans might fall into that. They have the Steelers on Sunday, and New Orleans just isn't scoring anymore. They won a game with 12 points the other night. Now, that yeah, some people say that's the development of the team. They actually have a team now. It's not just Drew Brees throwing the ball, and they can win a game 12-9. to 9. But early on, they were putting up the points. I mean, you remember the game they came in to Baltimore, and they were they could yeah. really score, and that seems to be going for them. It's not quite where yeah. it was. Well, the season was on. Players were down. Uh, you know, defense, defenses catch up to the offenses, and right now it's December football. You've got to be able to run the ball. You've got to be able to play good defense. Your special teams certainly factor in. All these are factors, and, uh, we'll see. It's going to be very interesting. It's very wide open. There's a lot of teams at this point still have a chance to make the playoffs. It's true, but the Ravens fit the mode you just talked about. The Bears fit the mode you just talked about. It, yeah. it would be a bizarre season if all these front runners suddenly have hit problems and you might get a Super Bowl of the Ravens and the Bears somehow down the road. I'd be okay with that. But even the Seahawks, you know, Pete Carroll, he's, a run, he's got a run first team. They run first 52% of the time. Uh, you got Russell Wilson back there. You've got a decent defense. They can also make some noise in the playoffs. They'll be very tough out. They can, but they go to San Francisco and lose. Uh, it, now they, you know, it's a week-to-week -week league. That's, that's a great point, Wayne. It's a week-to-week -week league. You've got to bring your A game because if not, uh, you'll, you'll be feeling sorry at the, end of the, at the end of the game. You will. Tennessee has been stomping on people. They have the Redskins. The Redskins had a bit of a miracle win on Sunday with a bunch of guys even Redskin fans had never heard of on that field and they managed to beat the Jaguars but Tennessee really looks to be coming on and as you said week to week the Colts have the Giants Tennessee has the Redskins you think that both the Colts and Tennessee are going to keep winning and do the Ravens fit into that yeah I think so I think they keep winning and the Ravens have to keep winning as well I, I, I like the I like all three of those teams chances to keep winning and make things interesting as we head into the final week of the season all right, so now on to the, the, the big stuff. Tell me about this Ford Edge ST. It's a great vehicle, uh, Wayne. My, my wife, she gets a Mustang in the spring, spring and summer. She gets, uh, in the fall and winter, she gets an Edge, and uh, we put her in a candy apple red ST, and she's enjoying it. She loves all the features of the vehicle, the way it drives. Uh, it is just a marvelous machine. 
Uh, how sporty is it for a? Uh, I guess it's a CUV, not really an SUV. Yeah, it's a CUV, but it's it's really a spaceship. I mean, with all the uh, new uh, features in the vehicle, uh, she's really enjoying it, trying to figure out how to use everything. <laughs> Well, you guys have your end-of-year specials. Tell me what's going on in the dealership. We have uh, pretty much 0% for 72 months, plus some cash back on everything. And, and, you know, the interest rates have gone up all over the place. And if you can get 0% right now, that's a deal. Most manufacturers don't have that kind of deal. And that'll save thousands of dollars over the uh, course of a loan. And Ford Motor Credit, they're buying deep for us. They're giving our customers the best rates out there. They're approving uh, all kind of loans at that 0%. So, uh, it's really a festive atmosphere, and people are saving thousands of dollars at Coons Baltimore Ford. All right, so before we let you go, uh, I need your opinion on two things, and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. There's a lot of kids skipping bowl games, and that was a big deal before. And now people are just going, eh, that's another kid who skipped a bowl game. Does it bother you? And at some point, like the kid from Bosa from Ohio State skipped half his mm-hmm. senior season. When you're trying to evaluate players does not playing the bowl game hurt or help see to me it i remember a couple of years ago oj howard how uh, he could have came out a year early uh, based on his big uh, performance against ohio state but he chose to come back one more year he played in the bowl game he won a national championship and to me that's my kind of player and it's a difference maker i know that last year christian mccaffrey missed the, his bowl game i think i think i understand the business decision behind it but if I have two prospects and if I'm an NFL general manager and they're very close, I'm going to pick the one that played in the bowl game. I'm going to pick the one that was there for his teammates. I think that speaks more to character. And to your point about Bosa, I wouldn't draft him uh, or first overall because because he is missing at the bowl game. He's not going to be there for his teammates. Not, he's not going to be there for the university. They gave him the scholarship. You know, They gave him the opportunity in the first place. That's my feeling. I know a lot of people don't agree with that, but – that's how I feel about it. Well, you've been evaluating players for a long time. Uh, second thing is, where can folks find you on the radio tomorrow? They can find me up the dial from you guys. Uh, they can just Google my name, Dennis Colossos. They'll see where I'm at. And uh, we'll have, is Bruce in town tomorrow or is he out of town? Bruce is out of town, but he'll be available via telephone. So uh, I know he loves oh. being on your show. So go ahead and give him a call and see if you can set that up. I'll get him on at 430 as usual. All right, Dennis, thank you for being on, and we will be back here on Coons Ford. Terp Talk after these commercial messages with Luke Jackson from Pressbox and Mason. This is Coons Ford Terp Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. All right, Bruce is away from the microphone this evening. This is Wayne Viner. We're listening to Turp Talk. I want to talk to Mason about Maryland basketball for a minute before we bring Luke on and start doing some year-end stuff. Mason, what did you make of having Maryland have a this long layoff in basketball that picks up again on Saturday at 5.30 versus Seton Hall? Uh, I think I like it. Um I've been back and forth with it. Obviously, you know, 11 days, uh, it's a long time during the season to not be playing basketball. But with finals, to give that, you know, three or four days and then just a general rest period, it, it's, a, it's a good thing. But, you know, if they lose this game on Saturday, everybody will say it's because, you know, they, they didn't play for 11 days. Well, you're, you're going to face that. And I really think Merrill needed a few more big games before they get to the Big Ten. But the schedule is what it is. So you got Seton Hall, then you have another break, and you have Radford, and then the schedule picks up with some intensity as we get into the Big Ten play. And then it's 18 Big Ten games, and that takes you all the way through March. So Well, before, I mean, Radford, they've beaten multiple Power 5 or Power 6, if you're talking about basketball teams, on the road this year. They've beaten Penn State. I think they beat they beat a few more. I mean, they beat a handful of them this year. And Seton Hall, of course, you know, they beat Kentucky. So you're not talking about two walkover games. I feel like that season starts now because these two are not going to be easy. Okay, I don't think they're walkover games, but I miss... 
I, I'm not, I don't remember what I was talking to before the show started, but I miss those big games that we used to have back in the Cole Fieldhouse days and some at Xfinity Center where Kentucky would come in over this period, or LSU or Arkansas back when they were good and Tony Massenburg played at Maryland. And you had some big focus games that you'd play over the holidays. And even though the students were out, you'd still sell the place out and it was still rocking, and we just don't really do that anymore. But basketball starts up again on Saturday, and the year's coming to an end. And with us to talk about his Terps of the Year is our good friend from Press Box. It's Luke Jackson. Luke, welcome into Terp Talk this evening. Thanks for having me, Wayne. Hey, it's it's always great to talk to you. Uh, we're so proud. You're one of the guys that we, we have really bonded with, and now you've really moved up at Press Box. What's your position there now? Uh, my title is the uh, managing editor, so uh, I work pretty closely with uh, Stan Charles, who I'm sure you know very well. Pretty well. He's been a great friend of the show. Stan is the one who actually got Bruce into radio, and then Bruce got me into radio, and it comes full circle as we all pulled Mason along from uh, being the young intern to being a star on the Young Terps. And this, this segment of Terp Talk is a, going to be a simulcast with the Young Terps as part of the podcast this week. All right, Luke. Mason, have at it. Luke, what are your Terp categories you had to pick Person of the Year for? Okay, so let's start off with the, the uh, male Terp of the Year. Uh, we went with uh, Connor Kelly for that one, who had a huge year uh, for the uh, Terps men's lacrosse team. Uh, and in the write-up of uh, Connor Kelly, uh, we included his quote about uh, what it was like to play for uh, the Maryland lacrosse program. Uh, and why it was such a fantastic experience for him. And, of course, he won a national championship, and he did a lot of fantastic things there. Uh, And so that's what we included uh, in in his write-up. And uh, another category that we had was Best Female Terp, uh, and we went – we were really deciding on two uh, female Terps. Uh, One was Linnea Gonzalez, who was – who we ended up choosing, who was the one of the stars on the field hockey team this year. And the field hockey team, of course, went to the uh, national championship and they lost to, I believe it was uh, North Carolina, if I'm not mistaken. And the other uh, we were uh, deciding on was uh, Megan Whittle, uh, who had an 84-goal season uh, for the uh, Terps uh, lacrosse team. So really it could have been either of those, uh, and we ended up going with Gonzalez. Uh, and but it could have been either of those. And there are some other uh, turf categories that we ha- we have on there. Uh, we have a category called best debut. Uh, who do you think uh, won that one? I'm going with Anthony McFarland. Mason, who do you have? Uh, McFarland's a good pick for that uh, one. Uh, Kyle not- Kyle picked Jay Sean Jones as the best yeah. debut game in the history of football. Right, right. And so we went with Jay Sean Jones. Um, so he scored touchdowns in that Texas game. Um, on his first three touches. And I think one was a pass, one was a run. If, if, if I'm not mistaken, it was a jet sweep, one of those Matt Canada jet sweeps. And a, another one was a uh, touchdown catch. Uh, so that was another one. And, th- and th- another ter- Terp category that we had, it, even though it wasn't really a Terp category, but it ended up uh, that way, was uh, best uh, male high school player. And we went with Mount St. Joe's and now Maryland's Jalen Smith. Well, you can't go wrong there, Mason. Do you have any counter moves to what Luke has? I mean, I think it's pretty solid. Um, Luke, there's also best turnaround went to a Maryland team, the Maryland oh, men's course. soccer team. Uh, and who'd we pick there? The turf soccer team. <laughs> best turnaround, absolutely. Uh, from what was the record at one point four five and three? Yeah, I think they were o two and two at one point. Of course, yeah. Part of that was because yeah. of the schedule that Sasho. Uh, puts out there, uh, I mean, his teams are battle-tested by the time conference play comes around. And I know before we uh, jumped on to talk about this, you were talking about how you wish the uh, the men's basketball team uh, had some more early season tests and, uh, and Xfinity Center was rocking. Well, Sasha does that. Uh, he, he knows exactly what his team's strength is strengths and weaknesses are by the end of September, uh, and his teams get much better as the season goes along. And I think a big part of that is how he schedules. Um, And he's not afraid to lose some games early because he Mm -hmm. learns about his team. Uh, And and it paid off for him this year. 
I think it's a shock. That yeah. If you said, what is the best attended, most fun Maryland sporting event to go to? That if you would have told me 20 years ago, oh, Friday night soccer is the best one. People think you're nuts. But it's turned out with the way he schedules that following the crew around and going to a soccer game is now a, a must part of being a Maryland fan. Mason, do you agree? Right. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the, the game day experience is by far the best of any at Maryland. Um, I don't know if that's that's a good thing or not, but that's a subject for another day. Well, we are the, as somebody once said, we want to be the UCLA of the East. We ended up being the Stanford of the East because we dominate all of these sports that, and this is my phrase, that nobody really cares about. I know they have devotees, but people care about football and basketball, and we managed to dominate field hockey and women's lacrosse and men's soccer, and and we win 30, we've won 30 Big Ten titles and four national championships over the past four or five years. And people go, eh, Maryland doesn't do that well. I go, no, <laughs> Maryland does very well. What do you guys make out of that Maryland doesn't do very well, yet we've got 30 Big Ten titles? Right. Well, it goes right. back to what the um, commissioner of the Big Ten said when he was asked about that, was, you know, somebody said, do you regret adding Maryland and Rutgers? And he said, well, you can't really put those two in the in the same conversation. Maryland's won all these Big Ten championships that bring us national titles and and that's the value. I know a lot of people think of the Big Ten, they think of football. Luke, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think Mason touched on it right at the end there. Uh, when when uh, your casual Big Ten fan or your casual college sports fan sees Maryland football losing by 40 points to Michigan or losing by uh, 40 points, uh, not this year, but uh, in prior years, losing by 40 points to Ohio State, uh, they automatically think, oh, Maryland doesn't belong in the Big Ten. They belong in the ACC. But like uh, you mentioned before, I mean, really in any other sport other than football, Maryland's been quite good. Um, And I think since they – Enter the Big Ten. Has any Big Ten team won more titles, uh, league no. titles, than Maryland? Mason says no, and I think actually, is... uh, I think I think one or two have. But okay, the bottom line is Maryland's dominant in those sports. And when you talk about Sasha, you know, when you talk about getting a team prepared for a national championship run, it is I will play any team anywhere. And now Maryland John basketball Tillman? hasn't really done that, and. That, that's part of it. You know, you look at what Kentucky does. They play anybody. You look at what Duke does. They'll play, you know, four or five really good teams. And then you look at what Maryland does. And that's part of why Xfinity Center lacks going back to those 11 days off. You know, if Maryland was playing Kentucky tomorrow, there would be people there. There would be people that would give up watching the Ravens or the Redskins to go to that game. But, you know, you put yourself up against good games. And, you know, seeing Hall's not a bad game. It's just, you know, the lack of scheduling. Sure. We've got about a minute here, guys. And yeah, it's as usual, bad luck for Maryland basketball. They have a game up against the Redskins play early, the Ravens play late, or you could go to the Maryland game. And then on the 29th, when Radford comes in, you've got uh, Alabama and Oklahoma, and you've got uh, Clemson and Notre Dame, and you're up against that. So it's going to be tough to draw a big crowd when you're up against major events. So... Well, I want to thank Luke for coming on. If anybody wants to look up these stories, where do they go, Luke? Uh, they can go to pressboxonline.com. It's all right there. And they can pick up a print, a co- print copy around town. Royal Farms will have them. All right. I think they'll have them in the lobby here at the radio station. I'll pick one up on the way out the door. Mason, this is going to go on as part of the Young Terps podcast. Where can people find that? Yeah, you can find the Young Terps podcast on TerpTalk.com, of course, and CapitalSportsBlog.com, and always on the Podomatic app. All right, guys. Thanks to Tony Massenberg, Dennis Gulatsis, Mason Viner, and Luke Jackson. Bruce is away from the microphone. We are off on Saturday. We will be back next Wednesday with Terp Talk, presented by Coons Ford.